today on Adventures in Faith with Jerry Savell. I'm very confident. Amen. I'm confident in my God and I'm confident in His Word. And I'm confident that in hard times, He will be my help. He will be my shield and He will rescue me. Hallelujah. Now let's open our Bibles to Psalm 33. Psalm 33, and once again, this is part one of a three-part series that I'll be doing, and I'm going to entitle it, In Hard Times, God Will Rescue You. Now in Psalm 33, beginning in verse 18, Behold, the eye of the Lord is upon them that fear him upon them that hope in his mercy to deliver their soul from death and to keep them alive in famine. Underline that phrase, to keep them alive in famine. Our soul waiteth for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. For our heart shall rejoice in him because we have trusted in his holy name. Now, it's amazing to me that he talks about famine, and then at the same time, he talks about, in other words, it appears he's saying, I know famine's coming, but I'm not moved by what I'm hearing, because I'm going to rejoice in the Lord. He's my help. He's my shield. And because I trust in his name, verse 22 Let thy mercy, O Lord, be upon us according as we hope in thee. Now, the message translation reads this way. God's God's eye is upon those who respect him, the ones who are looking for his love. He's ready to come to their rescue in bad times. He's ready to come to their rescue in bad times. I'm going to say that again. He's ready to come to their rescue in bad times. The Passion Translation says, the eyes of the Lord are upon those who wait in hope and expectation. Expectation. What are you expecting? Because it's a proven fact. You get what you expect. It may not happen overnight, but you keep expecting it and eventually you will experience it. Jesus said it this way, bid unto thee according to thy faith. Amen. Faith and expectancy are closely related. So what you expect is what will happen. What, how, how you exercise your faith and what you exercise your faith for is what you will experience, praise God. And the Bible says the just shall live by faith. Their lives shall be sustained by their faith. I have faith in God. I have faith in his word. I've been living this way for, uh, I'm in my 53rd year of living this way and praise God, I'm here to tell you, it still worketh, hallelujah. Can you say amen? Amen. So once again, even in uh, uh, times of, of trouble and famine, we are to expect God to be our help. Now, the word expectation means anticipating with confidence. Anticipating with confidence. Look at your neighbor and say, I'm a confident person. Now, many of you, your face didn't express that. Said with a big smile this time, I'm a confident person. (laughs) Amen. You know, a lot of people confuse confidence of people of faith with arrogance. Being egotistical. I'm not an egotistical person. Amen. I'm not an arrogant person. People that know me well know I'm not an arrogant person. To know me is to love me. Hallelujah. (laughs) But I'm confident. I'm very confident. Amen. Amen. I'm confident in my God and I'm confident in his word. 
and I'm confident that in hard times, he will be my help. He will be my shield and he will rescue me. Hallelujah. Anybody agree? Give the Lord a shout. Hallelujah. I'm anticipating no matter what comes down the pike, so to speak, God will rescue me. Hallelujah. Expectation also means looking forward to a future event with reason to believe that event will happen. Amen. Now, what am I expecting where a future event is concerned? I'm expecting God to rescue me. Amen. So I'm looking forward to a future event, God rescuing me with reason to believe that that's exactly what's going to happen. Hallelujah. That's expectation. So what is the event that we are looking forward to with confidence? God rescuing us in bad times. Can you say amen? amen. In famine, he will rescue us. Now, Psalm 37, just a page or two over. Psalm 37. And let's look at verse 18. Now, let's back up to verse 17. For the arms of the wicked shall be broken, but the Lord upholdeth the righteous. The Lord knoweth the days of the upright, and their inheritance shall be forever. They shall not be ashamed in the evil time, and in days of famine they shall be satisfied. Now, the message translation reads this way. In hard times... They, God's people, the upright, hold their heads high. When the shells are bare, they'll be full. Hallelujah. When there's a, let, let's, let's put it in modern day vernacular. In hard times, they'll hold their heads up high. When shelves are bare of food shortage, they'll be full. In a food shortage, in a catastrophe, in a famine, they shall be full. Hallelujah. You know, everything's increasing. Everything's increasing. Price of gas, price of bread. Can't even buy a candy bar for what it used to be. <laughs> everything's increasing. But if bread goes up to $15 a loaf, God will bless me with 16. Hallelujah. Because he's the God of more than enough. Hallelujah. Can you say amen? If gasoline goes up to $25 a gallon, he'll give me $26 for every gallon that I put in my car. He's the God of more than enough. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now the Passion Translation says, even in a time of disaster, he'll watch over them and, will always, and they will always have more than enough no matter what happens. Wow. Listen to that. Even in a time of disaster, he'll watch over them and they will always have more than enough no matter what happens. Glory. Amen. Now, it's important to notice that in the Bible, there is a definite distinction between what happens to God's people and what happens to the ungodly. May I ask which group are you in? I'm assuming everybody in here is in the group called God's people. If you're not in that group called God's people, oh, we're going to pray for thee. Because it is obvious you read your Bible that what happens to the ungodly is not what happens to the godly. What happens to the unrighteous is not what happens to the righteous. What happens to the unjust is not what happens to the just. Can you say amen? amen. Now, uh, let's, let's look at an example found in Psalm 1. Psalm 1. <clears throat> let's begin in verse 1. You all know this psalm. Probably learned it in Sunday school when you were a child. 
Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf shall also not, also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. Now, who are we talking about? Those that are walking in the counsel of God, the godly. But then notice how it starts with verse four. But the ungodly are not so. So there's a difference between what happens to the godly and what happens to the ungodly. Now, I've heard preachers get up and talk about, you know, all this is coming, all this is coming, hard times, bad times, and prophesied doom. And doom is coming. I'm not denying that. Hard times are coming. I'm not denying that. But the question is, what group are you in? Because what happens to the ungodly is not what happens to the godly. What happens to the unrighteous is not what happens to the righteous. Hallelujah. Now, the Passion Translation says, what delight comes to the one who follows God's ways? Anybody in here following God's ways? Yes. Then praise God, put a smile on your face because it said, what delight comes to those who follow God's ways? Amen. I refuse to walk around with my head down and a frown on my face and, and looking dejected and depressed and troubled. That's just not Jerry Savelle. That's not me. Amen. And the reason being is because I know the promises of God. Amen. I've lived by them. How many of you remember the old song, Standing on the Promises That Cannot Fail? That's what I've been doing for over 52 years, and not one of them has ever failed. So what delight comes to the one who follows God's way? Now, the Amplified reads this way. <clears throat> Blessed, happy, fortunate, prosperous, and enviable is the man who lives not in the counsel of the ungodly, following their advice, nor stands submissive and inactive in the path where sinners walk, nor sits down to relax and rest where the scornful and the mockers gather. Amen. What are mockers? People that that deny uh, God and deny the validity of his word. Amen. I don't sit with that group. Amen. And if I happen to be in their group, it won't be long. I get up and walk off. <laughs> Amen. Because sometimes, you know, you, you wind up in a, in a group of people that you don't know and, and you just, like Brother Hagin used to say, you can locate their faith in five minutes. Just listen to them talk. Amen. I've had to get up and leave in the midst of a group of preachers before. Brother Copeland and I were invited to a meeting in Washington, D.C. a number of years ago. And they had, they had preachers from every denomination and every camp. And I think he and I were the only two representing the word of faith. And I think the only reason they invited us is so they could say <laughs> we, had, we had word of faith people here too, you know. But boy, they didn't preach the word of faith. In fact, the first night we're sitting there and it was total unbelief, just religious tradition. And over 3,000 people are shouting over unbelief. Brother Copeland looked at me and he said, is there something wrong with us? I said, apparently so. We're the only two in here not shouting over all this religious tradition. He said, you want to stay for this? I said, not really. He said, let's leave. I said, sounds good to me. We got up and walked out. He said, what do you want to do? I said, well, we haven't had dinner. Let's go have some dinner. We ate dinner. And then we went back to our room. I turned on the television set. Andy Griffin was on. <laughs> I said, now, Kenneth, we can sit here and watch Andy Griffin because I know Barney will bring joy to us. <laughs> Hallelujah. Because we sure weren't getting in that meeting with all them preachers. 
Amen. Sometimes you even have to get up in a group of preachers. So notice it says, we don't sit down and relax where the scornful and the mockers gather. People that, that talk against God, talk against his word. Don't believe in the validity of it. I'm not, I'm not going to, I'm not going to uh, subject myself to their unbelief. Amen. Now, verse two says, but his delight is in the law of the Lord and his law doth he meditate day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. Anybody like prospering? Then follow the advice in Psalm 1. Hallelujah. Whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. Now the Passion Translation <clears throat> says it this way. His passion is to remain true to the word of I am. Meditating day and night on true revelations of light. He will be standing firm like a flourishing tree planted by God's design deeply rooted by brooks of bliss, bearing fruit in every season of life. He is never dry, never fainting, ever blessed, and ever prosperous. Ooh, that's something to shout about, praise God. Ever blessed, ever prosperous, hallelujah. Praise God, I'll drink to that. Amen. This is what the righteous can expect. This is what the godly can expect. But notice what it says in verse four, particularly from the Passion Translation, but how different are the wicked. Notice what we just read that the righteous can expect is not what the ungodly can expect. I'll ask you again, what group are you in? Everybody in here in the group called the righteous, the upright, amen then you can expect different results in times of trouble, times of famine than what the rest of the world is going to experience. Amen. That's shouting ground, folks. Hallelujah. But how different are the wicked? <clears throat> Verse five from the Passion Translation goes on to say, nothing they do will succeed or endure for long. Nothing they do will succeed or endure for long. And in verse six, he repeats it and says, but how different is it for the righteous? How different is it for the righteous? You say, why you got a smile on your face, brother Jerry? Because of this. Why you got a dance in your step, brother Jerry? Because of this. Why aren't you sad like others? Because of this. Why aren't you depressed over all this bad news? Because of this. Hallelujah. I got something else to rely upon. Praise God. Now I ask you once again, if you're one of the righteous and you're one of the upright and you're one of the godly, are you obligated to expect what they are going to get? Not at all. Amen. Will everybody experience the same thing? Not at all. It just depends on what group you're in. Let me remind you of this truth. Jesus said in John 17 and verse 16, they, his followers, are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Look at somebody and tell them, I'm not of this world. Tell somebody else, I am not of this world. I'm in it, but I'm not of it. <laughs> Say it again. I'm in it, but I'm not of it. Hallelujah. That means I do not have to live by their standards. I do not have to live by their beliefs. Amen. I don't have to follow on the path that they're on. Hallelujah. Now the message translation says, <clears throat> they didn't join the world's ways just as I didn't join the world's ways. In other words, he's talking about his followers. They don't join the world's ways. I haven't joined the world's ways. 
Like Brother Copeland said one time, some of you people have gone through three crises that Gloria and I didn't even know anything about. Because <laughs> we don't follow the world's ways. Now, I'm not oblivious to what's going on in the world. You know, my iPhone, I didn't ask for this. I didn't sign up for it. I don't think I did. But these breaking news reports pops up on my phone. Sometimes in the middle of the night, I hear my phone beep or a light comes on. And I'll look down to make sure it's not somebody, you know, one of the family members or something needs me or, or something's going on. And I'll look down and I'm in the middle of the night in some stupid thing with, there's a food shortage. There's a famine coming. Oh, come on. I'm sleeping. I know it's coming, but that don't mean I have to join it. Amen. Like my mama used to say, you know, my, my best friend growing up lived across the street from me, Kenny Henner. And Kenny and I were always doing something together. And, and uh, we, we wanted to go uh, play pool at the pool house, pool hall. And it was, the only one back then was downtown Shreveport, Louisiana. And it was called the Subway because it was in a basement. And, and Kenny and I wanted to go play pool. And mom said, you're not going. I said, why not, mom? She said, that's not a good environment. I said, but Kenny's going. She said, I don't care if Kenny's going, you're not going. I said, well, why not? Now, I always had in my mind that because I was so small for my age, that mom was always, as they said back then, keep me under her skirt tail or whatever the you know, <laughs> phrase was. And, and I wasn't big enough to take care of myself, you know. And I always thought that's why she won't want to let me do what other guys do. But no, she didn't want me in that environment. You know, we didn't know anything about drugs back then. But I later found out if you wanted to know something about them, the pool hall was where you could get the information, you know. <laughs> and uh, no, you're not going. I don't care if Kenny's going, you're not going. If Kenny jumps off the bridge in the Red River, you gonna join him? That was always her, you know. <laughs> well, I might, <laughs> you know. <laughs> <laughs> Because I, I did have a habit of jumping off bridges, you know. But <laughs> she said, well, you're not doing it this time, you know. Just because Kenny jumps off the bridge, you're not jumping off the bridge. That was always her thing, you know. So just because the rest of the world is screaming, crying, pulling their hair out, we don't have to. We're not of this world. We're in it, but we're not of it. Can you say amen? amen. I haven't joined the world's ways. I'm living my life by God's ways. Amen. Now, let's look at John chapter 16 and look at verse 33. I remember the first time I ever read this verse. And shortly after that, <clears throat> I was invited to speak in a little church, <laughs> a little they said it was full gospel, but after I got there, I found it was full of something, but it wasn't gospel. <laughs> and uh, a little tiny church, little wood frame church on the, on the far side of town there in Shreveport. And at least the pastor was brave enough to invite me to come, you know. But there were just a handful of people. And they were all sitting in the back. Nobody was sitting up front. And I thought that was strange. And so... They're all sitting back there, and I, I had just discovered this verse, and I was going to preach from it. John chapter 16, verse 33. These things have I spoken unto you, that in me you might have peace. Peace. Anybody got peace in here? Yes. Uh, when are we supposed to have peace? Just when everything's going well? Uh, all the time. Jesus said, the things I've said to you will bring peace. 
in the world, you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Amen. So I said, folks, you and I don't have to live like the world lives. What should you do when life gets hard? How should you respond to setbacks, failures, and times of trouble? Today's special offer, the God Will Rescue You special package, contains Jerry Savelle's three-part audio series, In Hard Times, God Will Rescue You. His best-selling book, The God of the Breakthrough Will Visit Your House, and the eye-opening book, The Nature of Faith. Discover how supernatural intervention is on the way. Obstacles preventing your breakthrough are about to be removed. In this package, Jerry teaches how to respond to adversity, how faith can grow or decrease, how to get out of survival mode, and how to receive your breakthrough. Don't delay. Call or go online now to jerrysavelle.org and request your copy of the God Will Rescue You special package. Be inspired to see God take unfavorable circumstances and turn them around for your benefit. Let Jerry strengthen your faith and understanding of God's breakthrough power. Thank you so much for joining me today, and I trust that the program has been such an inspiration to your faith, and I believe that you are now in position to experience a major breakthrough from God. Don't ever give up on God. Don't ever give up on His Word. God always comes through when we dare to trust Him, dare to take Him at His Word, and I'm telling you, God is going to rescue you in your troubled time. So just stay in faith. Don't give up, refuse to back down, and just expect God to do the miraculous. Amen. Before we leave the air, let me remind you once again of our special resource package, three CDs on the message that we've been talking about. In hard times, God will rescue you. This is God's promise to every one of us. God is not going to let you fail. God is not going to let you down. God is going to come through for you. And then right along with it, the book that I wrote some time back, The God of the Breakthrough Will Visit Your House. This is a powerful book. It has gone around the world. We still get testimonies from people talking about how that this book has positioned them to experience major breakthroughs in their life. It's part of the package. And then also we wanted to include a book that I wrote a number of years ago entitled The Nature of Faith teaching you how that your faith can be developed, how that it can grow, and how that it can put you in position to experience what once seemed impossible is now possible. So this is a special resource package we have available for you this week. Go online, jerrysavelle.org. Place your order today while it's fresh on your mind. We'll get it to you just as quickly as we possibly can. Join us again next time. And remember this, your faith will overcome the world.